Hello guys, in this video we are going to be setting up my new workbench PC. This is going to be the computer that's going to stay on this desk and will help me facilitate when I'm working on other computers or when I'm working on servers or networking gear in the server rack. So I really need to have a computer that I could have right here on the desk. I could pull up, you know, a console or whatever, connect into a server, log in to web GUIs, download drivers when I'm building computers, stuff like that. I just need a computer down here in the shop to help facilitate when I'm working on stuff. So I picked up a Lenovo ThinkCenter M900 Tiny. Now this right here, this is a really, really neat unit. This is one, this is Lenovo's Tiny series, which it's sort of like a thin client, but it's not a thin client. This right here can run full Windows on it. And this right here has a desktop grade CPU in it as well. Upgradable RAM, M.2 slots, and even can take a 2.5 inch um, hard drive or SATA SSD. These units right here are very, very cool. They're tiny. These are considered the 1L form factor size. Um, Lenovo has them, HP has them, Dell has them. They call them different names. Um, Lenovo calls them tinies. And I believe Dell calls them micros and HP calls them minis. But uh, these units are really cool. They, they're just as powerful, if not more powerful, than laptops. And they give you lots of I.O. And they're just, they're awesome. So this unit right here, I picked up for about um, $70 from my previous employer on eBay. <laughs> but you can get these units for a lot cheaper, okay? Depending on what generation they are. This right here uses Intel 6th gen, okay? So this will take 6th gen processors. So let me go over the specifications of this unit and what it can support, so you guys can get a better understanding of it. This right here supports Intel's T-series CPUs, which T-series are desktop grade CPUs, they're socketed socketed CPUs, so the CPU is not soldered on. It is socketed, so you can actually upgrade the CPU in this unit, which is what we're going to be doing later on in this video. We're gonna max it out. We're gonna upgrade the CPU in it, which is awesome, okay? So the T-series CPUs from Intel are basically the low power series um, CPUs. And they generally use a TDP around 35 watts. So they don't eat up a whole lot of power and don't dissipate a whole lot of heat, which is why they are perfect for in these um, small form factors, okay? So the CPUs that this can support, I'll overlay the, uh, the list here, but this can support anywhere from a Pentium G4400T, which is a two core, two thread CPU with a base clock of 2.9 gigahertz, no turbo, all the way up to an i7-6700T, which is a four core, eight thread, 2.8 gigahertz base, 3.6 gigahertz boost CPU. Of course, it has integrated graphics as well. And that CPU is right here. So we will be upgrading to the 6700T, okay? Which is going to be awesome. This supports up to 32 gig of DDR4 um, SODIMM RAM. So it takes basically laptop form factor RAM. I mean, given its size, that makes sense. And it uses either Intel HD Graphics 510 or 530, depending on what the processor has. Ours has Intel um, HD 530. This, this supports a wide variety of uh, Wi-Fi cards, you can change in and out. I'll overlay the list there. And this also has Intel vPro, okay? We'll get into Intel vPro later, but that is something that's either scary or something that's really cool. <laughs> so we will explain that later, and that will actually probably be in a separate video. I will go over Intel vPro and what AMT is, okay? Intel AMT. Basically, in short, it allows you to remotely control computers similar to an IPMI, okay? It's not a full-fledged IPMI like on a server like iDRAC or ILO. It's not that advanced, 
but it at least does give you a KVM and allows you to do a couple neat things. So, uh, and that will depend on what CPU you put in this. So there are several CPUs that can go in this unit that support vPro and the chipset of the motherboard in this unit supports um, vPro as well. So let's go ahead and look at the front and the back. I'll get you guys a better camera angle, but you guys can see this is this is a nice little unit. This thing is tiny, okay? And I will compare it to a phone. I'll get out a, uh, a tape measure here just so you guys can see. So in relation to my phone, this unit is pretty much just a hair longer than my phone. So see that, guys? I know well how that picks up on camera, but I think you get the drift. This unit is tiny and pretty lightweight. So I'll go ahead and measure it. So a little over seven inches, seven inch exactly, inch and a half. So about seven by seven by an inch and a half deep here so a very tiny unit okay okay so on the front we have the power button we have you barely can make it out but we have the hard drive activity light we have a usb 3.0 5 gigabit port we have a microphone jack headset jack and another usb 3.0 5 gigabit port and then we have a nice little grill that allows um intake for ventilation see think center so that's the front on the side just have the serial number so on the back we have a port for the power adapter now the cool thing about these units is they get fed by lenovo's laptop power adapters okay which i'll show you guys the power adapter later but the great thing about that is there's an abundance of, of Lenovo power adapters for their laptops, you know, all their ThinkPads. So getting a replacement power adapter, or if you don't have one, will be very easy to obtain, okay? So these right here just take a typical Lenovo 65-watt power adapter, and I will show you guys the power adapter later, later get you guys the exact model and stuff, but um, that's how these units are powered, okay? You have a display port a USB 5 gig port, another display port, another USB 5 gig port, a headphone jack, another USB 5.0 port, and another USB 5.0 port. You have a slot right here where you can put in a Wi-Fi antenna. This particular one doesn't have a Wi-Fi card in it, so I don't have that available, but you can easily add that. You just pop that out, get the antenna, and then get a Wi-Fi card that pops into it. This right here is an expandable slot. You can change it out for whatever you want. You can have it be another display port, HDMI port, VGA port, or serial port. Pretty neat. And here's another nice thing. You got a screw right here. This, this single screw will allow you to take the entire cover off and have full access to everything inside. So easy to maintenance. Then you have a fan grill right here, which is where the heat sink for the CPU lies okay you also have a King kingsington lock as well to help prevent theft on the other side you just have you know pretty bare right so we'll also take a look at the top and bottom then we're going to crack the hood on this bad boy okay so on the top you notice this will say Intel Core i5 V Pro because this unit came with the i5 6500T, okay, when I bought this unit. And that's that's pretty much the typical CPU that you'll see these units will have by default. But like I said, the CPU in this unit is a desktop grade CPU that is fully socketable and upgradable, which is awesome, okay? Then you just have Lenovo. And this right here, this is this entire chassis. It's all solid metal. Okay, I don't know how well you guys can depict that here. Maybe a drumstick will depict it better. 
See, that's solid metal. That's not plastic. Okay? So that's what the top looks like. These units are built awesome. Unlike thin clients, these units are, are built solid. Okay? Another cool feature about these, so this is the bottom of the unit. This will tell you the model number. This is, a, this is the Think Center M900. And the specific model is 10FL. It uses 20 volts, 3.25 amps. And like I said, I will tell you guys the specific model number and everything later on. We got some rubber feet. And a cool thing about these units, when you buy them, um, a lot of them will, will have a Windows 10 Pro license embedded into the UEFI. So if you buy one of these, you use, say, $70, you're actually getting a deal. You're getting like another $150 worth of value for that Windows 10 Pro license as well. So when I go and install Windows 10 on this, it will automatically, automatically pick up the Windows 10 Pro license and activate, okay? So the license is tied to this actual machine, the motherboard, okay? So when you buy one of these, you wanna look, you wanna look for it says Pro. You want it to say Pro, it will have the license tied to the UEFI. So you don't have to worry about buying a product key for Windows 10 or pirating, okay? There's no reason to have to pirate when you have one of these units, you will have a legit um, Windows 10 installation there, okay? And just for reference, because you, know, you guys know I am, I love Windows 7, I'm a Windows 7 guy, I run it on my workstation with an ESU license. These units do support Windows 7, okay? This, per this particular model does. And it does have all native drivers for, for Windows 7. You may be asking, why ain't I putting it on there? Well, it is December of 2022, and ESU will expire February of 23. So it would be kind of foolish for me to go ahead and put Windows 7 on this. There's not much lifetime, and plus I'd have to buy three years worth of ES ESU license to get this patched. So it doesn't make sense for this unit. It made sense for my, for my workstation at the time because I did my workstation back in 2019. So... Uh, this unit will be getting Windows 10 Pro. Now, however, this unit does not um, natively support Windows 11, okay? Because this is a six, this has a sixth gen processor. It's not new enough. You have to have eighth gen for Windows 11, which I know it's a load of bullshit. So, just be know if you if you do plan on wanting Windows 11 support or running Windows 11, this unit won't do it natively, okay? Yes, there are bypasses. You can bypass the validation checks and one run Windows 11. As an IT company, I don't recommend doing hacks or bypasses because they are likely to break down the road. So if I was building a computer for a customer or using this for a customer, I wouldn't do that. If, if they require Windows 11 or need that additional support, I would not use this particular unit for that application. But uh, natively, no, this won't support Windows 11, okay? So just a side note there. So why would somebody want to have one of these tiny units? Well, they differ from, they differ from a thin client in that they, a thin client is basically a very underpowered unit that basically runs an operating system remotely. It's kind of like the actual OS runs as a VM on a server that has, you know, the proper performance, proper power, if that makes sense. And it's basically like sending kind of like a remote RDP stream or something like that to the thin client that's underpowered. So the actual OS and stuff on a thin client does not run on the thin client, if that makes sense. It will run a it will run a tiny Windows install like, you know, like a embedded Windows 10. Okay? So this right here is not a thin client. The operating system directly runs off of this, and this has the horsepower of a regular laptop or even a desktop. I mean, this this these units, especially the newer ones, I mean, you can get CPUs with a CPU benchmark of like 13K, okay? So these units are very, very capable, okay? This unit right here with the upgrade CPU 
will beat my gaming laptop from 2015 that's over there on the server rack, which I'll show later when I compare the CPUs. But this unit, these units are great because if you're not gaming or doing anything really intensive, say you're just doing basic web browsing, watching YouTube videos, stuff like that, this will be perfectly fine for it. Take up a low profile and use low power consumption, okay? Now for a workbench PC, this right here is excellent, okay? This has all the IO I need, you know, physical NIC on it, everything. I'll be able to hook up a monitor. I'm gonna be adding a serial port to this unit. So when I communicate with switches and stuff in my, over there on my server rack, this right here fits the bill, okay? This unit right here. These also make great um, home theater PCs as well. Say you wanna run Kodi or watch Plex, stuff like that. You can put one of these in your living room and they can effectively be an overkill Roku, okay? These units right here are pretty fucking neat. And when I pop off the hood, you guys are gonna understand more, okay? So I think we need to do that. I think we need to take the hood off of this. Okay, so let's go ahead and take off the hood of this. I'll show you how that works. So all you need is just a regular Phillips screwdriver and you just unscrew the one screw that's in the back and then you push this forward, if that makes sense. It just slides forward and then the cover lifts right off. So I don't know how well you guys saw that on camera, but as you saw, just slides right off, easy access to everything inside this unit. Okay guys, so here is inside the unit. Try to get the best camera angle I can. So what you have is you have the main heatsink fan. This easily comes off. You have a tray to put a 2.5 inch hard drive or SSD, and this comes right off. You have your heat sink, and then under it, you'll have access to your M.2 slot and to your RAM, okay? So let me go ahead and take this, uh, this hard drive tray out. This tray comes out very easily. Now, if you have a Wi-Fi card in here, the antenna will be attached to this hard drive tray, okay? So you'll have to take note of that. When you take this tray out, make sure you reattach the antenna because this hard drive tray helps act as the Wi-Fi antenna, if that makes sense. So I'll go ahead and take this tray off. All you do is just take off this one screw right here and the tray just slides right out. Okay, so we have the tray out. Hope you guys could see that okay. So now we have access to everything. You can see that the SATA connector here for the 2.5 inch SSD or hard drive is basically built onto the board. I like that. On some of these models, it will be like a, a little cable that connects to the motherboard. But in this case, it's nice and built onto the motherboard. So it's more robust. So you guys saw the caddy just comes right out. And you can take that out. Now right here, you have access to the RAM. This came with eight gig of RAM. We are going to max it out. We're gonna put 32 gig of RAM in here. Right here, you have access to install your Wi-Fi card, okay? Here you have your CMOS battery, and you have lots of headers on this board. So these headers will allow you to add additional connectivity. Say you wanna change out this uh, display port with something else, you can do that. I actually have the serial cable coming to where I can swap out. I don't need a third display port. So I'm gonna remove that and add a serial port, okay? It'll be a COM2 port. So I'll be able to console into switches and other gear in my server rack, if that makes sense, okay? We also have a M.2 slot in here, which you guys probably barely make out. I'll get you guys an, another angle to show you that M.2 slot. Okay, hopefully you guys can see that a bit better now. There is the M.2 slot that's in this unit, and this does support both SATA M.2 drives and MVME-based M.2 drives. So the sizes this supports, I'll have to look in the uh, 
documentation, I believe it says on here. It doesn't say the ones it supports right offhand. Just says M.2 SSD PCIe or SATA interface. You do have the various holes where you can add the standoff. If you guys look, if I switch it around, you guys can see right there. This right here will allow you to basically attach the M.2 drive. So this right here acts as the screw. And you can pop this out and change it. See right there? So it'll allow you to change. So there's two configurations you either have. Uh, trying to read it. I don't think it says. So either halfway or full way. So whatever those dimensions are. Or the two it supports. But the, the drive I'm going to be putting into it is a 970 Evo Plus. So... It will fit. There's a better view of the RAM. You have lots of jumpers on the board as well to reset the BIOS and all kinds of things you can do on this board. It's It has a lot going for it. So let's talk about the upgrades because we are going to max this board out. We're going to upgrade the RAM, upgrade the CPU, and install an M.2 drive as well. Okay. Okay, so the first thing that we are going to upgrade is the RAM. This unit supports up to 32 gig of DDR4 SODIMM, up to 2133 megahertz. Now this RAM right here is actually 2400 megahertz, which is fine. Um, what will happen is the RAM will downclock, okay? So if you do have faster RAM, it's fine, it'll still work. However, you'll have slightly higher cast latency, okay? So you generally want to match the highest speed that the memory controller of the CPU and motherboard chipset can support, okay? Which in this case is 2133. However, Crucial did not have that available at the time. So 20, 2400 is fine, okay? It's, it will still work. So these modules, basically I have two 16 gig DDR4 SODIMM modules from Crucial. I'll overlay the exact part for you guys and 32 gig cost roughly about $100, okay? So an easy upgrade. So we're easily gonna max this board out. So let's go ahead and install it. So the first thing we gotta do is remove the old RAM. This has a single eight gig module. And what you do is these, you have these clips on the side. You basically pinch them outward. This will pop up and it'll, you'll be able to pull it out, okay? Then we'll install the RAM. Now the reason I go with Crucial is Crucial is one of the major DRAM manufacturers, okay? You have three major DRAM manufacturers. You'll have, you'll have, you have Micron, SK Hynix, and Samsung. Those are the three that actually make the DRAM, okay? And Crucial is uh, owned by Micron, okay? Micron is the parent company of Crucial. And what I like is you're able to directly buy the RAM from Micron using Crucial. I'm not aware of anywhere where you can directly buy RAM from SK Hynix or Samsung. You have to be an OEM for that, as far as I have found, okay? I haven't found anywhere we can just go to Samsung and just buy Samsung, you know, RAM, okay? Those are usually gave to OEM partners like Dell, HP, etc. So I really like Crucial because you can directly buy legit RAM, okay? All the other RAM whether it be Corsair, G-Scale, Kingston, stuff like that, those are assemblers. They'll buy the DRAM from Micron, SK Hynix, or Samsung, and they will assemble it and manufacture it onto their own PCBs, if that makes sense. Um, I generally like to buy direct from one of the major three. So we're going to go ahead and install this now. Now this is notched, it will only go one direction. So you have to pay careful attention to where the notch is at.
And just like that, we have maxed out this board. We just installed 32 gig of DDR4 RAM. Let's move on to the next thing. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna swap out the CMOS battery. I do this on all installs I do. Reason being, you don't know how long this unit's been sitting around. So it's always a good idea to swap out the CMOS battery. So how these come off is they'll have a little clip here on the side. You'll take like a flathead and push it that way. And this will just pop right out. This will also reset the BIOS to factory defaults. So when you get one of these used units, it's a good idea to do that and then go back into the BIOS and change some things. So there we go. Kind of a little tricky when you have a big camera in my in my way. But these just take, and I, let me zoom this out so you guys can see. These just take um, CR2032s, okay? That's the model. CR2032, you can pick these up at any store, Walmart, you know, Target, whatever. Uh, I recommend getting lithium ones, which mo most are going to be. So we're going to go ahead and pop it in. It just snaps in just like a coin cell battery. Yep, got the new battery. We'll go ahead and put it in. Uh, I will note these batteries, you're really not supposed to touch them with your fingers because you're, you're, the oil's on your fingers, but it'll be fine. Ideally, you want to have nitrile gloves on, but uh, it'll be fine. So we're going to just go ahead and pop it in. Like I said, you can pick these up at any store. CR2032 type batteries. There we go, you just have to get that clip out of the way to get to latch in there, but now we have the new one installed. You will note that this will also reset the, the date and time on the unit, so you have to go into BIOS and set that, especially before you go and install an OS, stuff like that. It's just good to have it somewhat accurate. But uh, yeah, the old battery's been removed. It's that simple, guys. Okay, guys, next thing we're going to install is our M.2 SSD. This is the Samsung 970 EVO Plus. This is a one terabyte NVMe based SSD. This uses TLC based flash and does have a proper DRAM cache. When I go to get SSDs, I always recommend getting Samsung. I would have put a 970 or a 970 Pro in this. However, those are very hard to get now. That was the SSD that has MLC based flash, which is better than TLC. But nowadays, the markets all go into TLC or QLC. Um, as you guys know, TLC is inferior to MLC, but it's pretty much hard to get MLC-based SSDs anymore unless you're, you're an enterprise and you're willing to pay thousands of dollars. So this right here, one terabyte, plenty enough for a workbench PC and plenty fast enough. And this... Uh, this cost around $100, okay? So another $100. So we'll go ahead and uh, unbox it and then we'll go ahead and install it. So guys, go ahead and look at that. That's the SSD we're going to be putting in this bad boy. Ain't she a birdie? Ain't she pretty? Okay, so one terabyte, 970 EVO Plus. Like I said, this uh, this unit will take both 
M.2 SATA and M.2 NVMe. Um, I believe it's PCI Express Gen 3, so don't be putting like a Gen 4 drive in here. You'll just be wasting your money, okay? Um, and this is a Gen 3 drive. And, uh, oh, this, the size support of the Think Center, I will overlay if I'm able to find that. I'm not able to find it in the specification sheet, which is kind of silly. But if I can find that information, I will overlay it for you guys. So let's go ahead and install it. There we go. The SSD has been installed. Kind of hard to see that, but it just goes in one way. It's notched. You have to put it in it at an angle, and it's like a diving board. And you, you push it down, and then you what you do is you'll lock in that retention clip, which I will show you guys here. Maybe. Yeah, maybe you guys can see it now. See how that goes? This just clips in. You want to make sure this stays all the way down. You'll hear you'll hear this snap when you push down on that. And it puts right in just like that, guys. So SSD has been installed. Nice. So that's what it looks like with the SSD installed. So we got the RAM installed and the SSD and a brand new CMOS battery. The next thing we're going to do is upgrade the CPU. Now, let me go ahead and tell you guys what CPU we're putting in this bad boy and what kind of a, power, what kind of a uh, performance difference it will make. It's quite impressive. Okay, guys, so the CPU that is currently in this unit is an Intel Core i5-6500T. This is a four-core, four-thread CPU with a base clock of 2.5 gigahertz, boost clock of 3.1 gigahertz. It has a six megabyte um, layer three cache. Um, the memory controller is gonna be all the same in these units, maxing out a DDR4-2133. HD 530, um, integrated Intel graphics and it does support vPro. So the current CPU has a TDP of 35 watts, okay? So like I said, four cores, four threads. And the CPU mark is 4,844, single thread of 1814. The CPU that we're going to be installing into this unit is we're basically going to be maxing this unit out. So it's going to, we're going to give it the best CPU that it can take, okay? Which is the Intel Core i7-6700T. Has a base clock of 2.8 and a turbo of 3.6. And it's a four core, eight thread. So we, we have hyper threading enabled on this new CPU, okay? So it'll give us four additional threads, if that makes sense. And it also carries the same TDP. So no additional power, and no additional heat dissipation, which is awesome. So this we get a boost from 2.5 gigahertz to 2.8, and a turbo from 3.1 to 3.6. Okay, so a pretty decent upgrade, right? And the comparison is we go from 4844 on the CPU bench to 7249. Okay, so that's a pretty significant upgrade. And our single thread improves from 1814 to 2077, okay? RAM is the same, you know, DDR4, um, 2133. Now, the interesting thing is both these CPUs sh show support for up to 64 gig in their memory controllers. However, Lenovo says this unit can only take 32 gig. I've heard reports of some people able, get, able to get 64 gig to work in this unit. However, I'm not going to... Uh, mess around with that right now at this time because it's not officially supported by Lenovo, okay? So just bear that in mind. If you do get 64 gig, it may or may not work, okay? So I'm just going to go with what Lenovo says. But I did notice that discrepancy. It says that the CPU's memory controller can support up to 64 gig. So I don't know if it's a chipset limitation or what, what is going on there with Lenovo. Okay, now compared to my uh, laptop... I hope you guys can see that pretty well. Now, compared to my laptop, over there, that is an Asus gaming laptop running a 4th Gen i7 from 2015. This 
this workbench computer right here, this little tiny thing, right, has much better performance, blows it out of the water. So let's go ahead and compare it. So that laptop over there, which is kind of being used like a workbench PC, but not really. It just, you know, it runs stuff over there in the background. But it has an Intel Core i7 4710HQ, base clock of 2.5 gigahertz, turbo 3.5. And the score on that is 5504. So we're going from 5504 to 7249. Okay. The CPU in that is better than the current CPU that's in the unit, but the upgrade CPU, miles better. Okay. Yeah. In that uh, laptop does have four cores, eight threads, just like the upgrade CPU. However, the TDP is higher on that laptop. 47 watt TDP versus 35. So this unit, this Lenovo Think Center with the upgrade CPU gonna take less power and blow it out of the water performance wise. Now this that unit does have discrete graphics in it. The laptop does. Okay. It does have an NVIDIA, you know, laptop graphics in it. Whereas this will just have you know integrated Intel graphics. So the graphics performance is probably pro definitely probably gonna be better on that on that laptop. However from, from a CPU performance standpoint, the Think Center is better. Okay. So that's just an overview of the performance for the CPUs. So I'll go ahead and show you guys the upgrade CPU. Um, you're, you can get these units off eBay. I bought mine for $70. However, sometimes you can get them a little bit cheaper around the $50 mark. So $70 for, for the upgrade CPU, not bad at all. Again, that is the i7-6700T. You'll have to put a T variant CPU in these, guys. You can't put an i7-6700. It has to be, be the T variant which the T variant is the low power variant. Okay, guys? Low power variant usually maxes out around 35 watt TDP. Okay? So, guys, here is the upgrade CPU. I have it in an anti-static bag. I don't know how well you guys can see that. But it is indeed an i7-6700T. Okay? So, we're going to go ahead and take the heat sink off of this unit. Uh, pop out the old CPU, put the new one in. How's that sound? I think it sounds pretty cool. Okay, so the first thing we're going to have to do, I've never done this before, I should probably look at the manual, but we're going to try to wing it here, is we're going to have to take the fan off. Okay, so this fan has some two screws right here, so I'm going to take them screws out. Okay, so I stand corrected. It takes three screws and the screws don't come all the way out. Once you screw them and they start like clicking with you, you stop screwing them. So see how I did that? The screws stay in the unit and the fan just pops out like that. So now we have access to the heat sink. Now you will note that the speaker, this does have a built-in little tiny like one watt speaker, just, just mainly for notification messages, you know, stuff like that, beeps. Um, the speaker will slide out and then you'll be able to take this this heat sink off, okay? And it looks like we have our main uh, chipset controller under there too. Nice. So this heat sink's gonna be uh, interesting. The main goal with taking heat sinks off is you always wanna do it evenly. You know, you don't wanna have too much pressure in one area. So that's just a general rule of thumb with any heat sink that you remove.
I feel like I'm missing a step, guys. I might have to go look at the manual. Well, I got all the screws off. However, the heat sink's not easily coming right off, which leads me to believe this uh, plastic speaker grill or whatever, this has to pop off somehow. I don't want to break it. So I'm going to go look at the manual and see how this comes off. Now, the, the, the CPU fan here, you know, that's already been... Uh, moved out of the way. You don't really, you can disconnect it if you want. You don't have to, but that's moved out of the way. That shouldn't be interfering with it at all. I looked at the back, uh, heat sink fins there. I don't see them screwed in any, anywhere. Uh, so I don't know. Like I said, I'm going to have to go look at the, uh, the manual and see how this works. So we'll be right back and take a look. Okay guys, after looking through the manual, you have to remove the speaker and then remove the speaker holder and then the heat sink can come off. And of course you firstly have to remove the fan, which I already did do that. That's out of the way. So that shouldn't be interfering. So first thing is I got to remove the uh, connector for the speaker, which is a little tiny white little connector down there. So you might need to get a little needle nose pliers to get that off without breaking it. So I'm going to try to do that, uh, very carefully. That will be a lot of fun. It looks like it only goes in one way. Red is on this side. Okay, just for my reference. Well, I got the connector off. Now I got to get this speaker out of here, which <laughs> isn't the easiest thing to do. There's these two posts that you have to push outwards, and then the speaker slides up and out. Um, easier said than done. It'll be a miracle if the speaker still works after we put it back together. <laughs> Yay, you got the speaker out. Is it in one piece? <laughs> I don't know. Now they said that this, you do it from this side here and this should just lift off. I'm not sure how this is gonna come off without breaking. Well, there we go. <laughs> Just apply a little bit more power to it. I hope nothing broke. I don't think anything broke. There we go, guys. I didn't really have to take the cover off at all. I guess I shouldn't have unscrewed the uh, the heat sink before doing that, but oh well. But uh, 
as you guys see, there's thermal compound. There's the existing CPU. We'll go. We'll clean that CPU up. We'll put the new heat sink or the new CPU in. Then we'll put the heat sink back on after applying new thermal compound. I'll show you guys the heat sink here. Not sure how well you guys can see. This uh, speaker thing does pop right off. Okay, so once I clear this off, I will pop this off. There's these tabs under it, and that pops out. And you should take off the uh, this speaker holder, as they call it, before you unscrew the heat sink screws. So that's why the entire thing came up with me. But I think that's all right. I don't think anything was damaged or anything in that process. But uh, yeah, I was able to get the speaker out. Uh, hopefully without doing too much uh, damage, right? It's just a little, little 8 ohm 1.5 watt speaker, according to the specifications. Very tiny. So we'll go ahead and clear up this thermal compound off both the CPU and the heatsink, and I'll get the tools for that set up. Okay, guys, so the tools that you use for clearing out thermal compound on CPUs and heat sinks is you're going to use isopropyl alcohol. Generally, you want 99%, but 91% will work just as well. It just will take a little bit longer to evapor evaporate. You'll need a tiny little glass. So I got a little tiny glass here that I will pour some iso alk into. Going to need a bunch of Q-tips. Okay, I don't know if that's on cam, but it should be. I think I need some thermal compound. So I just have some Noctua NTH1 thermal compound. I couldn't find where I put my MX4. I'll have to buy more of that. And uh, Neil knows pliers. I just have these to take the cap off of the thermal compound without getting it all over me. So it's good to have that. So I'll go ahead and pour some of this ISO alcohol into the cup. You'll uh, just dip your Q-tips in it, and then you'll just wipe off the thermal compound on both the heat sink and the CPU. Then we'll take the CPU out, the, the existing CPU out of the system and then put in the new CPU. That makes sense, guys. Thing with this ISO alk, it is flammable. Um, it also will evaporate if you don't put the cap back on, okay? So two things to note when you mess around with this type of uh, substance. So don't be like smoking near it or, you know, trying to light any fires or anything, you know? good to get this as clean as possible because you want to make best thermal con contact. So another thing to note, most thermal compound is non-conductive. So if a little tiny bit gets on anything, it's not going to really hurt anything. It shouldn't. But uh, you do want to get this as clean as possible. So once I get this heat sink as clean as possible, I'll try to pop this, this little plastic speaker cover off. And then we'll go ahead and clean up the existing CPU and remove it from the socket. Another thing I'll do is I'll get out a thing of canned air and I'll also try to blow off anything as well. This will also help expedite the uh, evaporation process.
Please also note, you can, since you have canned air, you can also dust out the heat sink as well, you know, which I did. Didn't really need it. It was a pretty clean unit anyway. So the heat sink has been uh, cleaned. I don't want to use up too much of my Q-tips and stuff because we still got to clean up the CPU. But, uh, yeah, I might hit this later after I clean the CPU off. But let's, let's see if I can pull this uh, speaker thing off. It should just pop off. It's really on there. I might have to take a flathead to it. Or needle nose pliers. There we go, I got it off. Hopefully, didn't cause too much damage, right? <laughs> so that's part done. We'll go ahead and uh, readjust the camera and we'll clean up that existing CPU and get it out of the socket. Clean enough, we'll go ahead and take it out of the socket. So you have this little retention clip, you push down and go outwards, and then the old clip right off. Okay, so we just put the new CPU in. As you can see, this is the, I don't know how well you guys can see the text, but it is the i7-6700T. Now a few things to note when you're swapping out CPUs. You always want to grab them by the edges. You never want to touch the bottom or anything. You don't want your finger oils and stuff to get on the gold contacts. Another thing I'll note, uh, there's a little gold triangle. You want to match it up with the one on the board. So it's right here. You have a little gold triangle on the CPU, but you'll have a marking on the actual socket. You'll just uh, very gently place the CPU, not push it in, not shove it, not throw it, drop it. Just gently place it in there. And then once you have it seated, you'll, you'll wiggle it from side to side, this way and this way, until it's fully seated. 
And as you can see, the CPU is fully seated, okay? And there is some thermal compound from the previous uh, application of this, because this is a used CPU, you know, it was, it was a pool, right? So I will clean up that CPU and also clean up the surface. I'll clean up the CPU that I pulled out as well, and we'll put that in an anti-stack bag to store it away in storage. But I'll go ahead and clean up this more, and then we'll put the, the lid back on. And then we can put the uh, heat sink back on, which will be a lot of fun, right? Okay, got the CPU nice and cleaned. We'll go ahead and apply some thermal, a little bit of thermal compound and we'll get this heat sink back installed. Hopefully I'll get on there right. And then we'll proceed. Okay, we got some thermal compound on there. That might be a hair too much. Might get a toothpick and get some of that off there. Okay, okay I think we have a decent application there. I will clean up the uh, heat sink a little bit more and then we'll install it.
there we go. The heat sink has been reinstalled. Hopefully I did everything right. <laughs> so uh, now we are going to install that uh, cover back on. So it goes like this. It'll go like that. It just snaps on, I believe. We'll put the speaker back in, try to reconnect it. I'm also going to remove this uh, extra display port connector because I will be having a serial port coming later. So we'll get that out of there. We'll put the heat sink back, the heat sink fan back on. And I think we'll pretty much have most of the physical upgrade to this unit done. Oh, it just snaps right back on. Hopefully nothing's broken, right? <laughs> so now the fun part is putting that speaker back in. It's so tiny. This connector, it's so fucking tiny. It's hard to it's hard to see or maneuver with it. I'm gonna go to the front and see if this speaker's fully seated. And then I'm gonna see if I can get this connector back on. It's gonna be fun. Okay, so I got that on. There's these little connectors that help cable manage that little connector. I think the connector is all the way in. The only way we're going to know is when we boot the system and get it to do a beep. If we hear a beep, the speaker still works. So hopefully the speaker still works. So I'm going to go ahead and take off this uh, third display port. There's a little connector right here. So there's two screws in the back. Self-explanatory, you just unscrew it. This, this pops up. You take the connector off. So, third display port has been removed. Move that out of the way and keep a hold of these screws because I might need these screws for when I screw in the uh, serial port when I get it. We'll go ahead and put the heat sink fan back on. In case you guys didn't see that on, on the camera angle, here is that display port, third display port. Like I said, just unscrew it from the back, disconnect the connector, very self-explanatory. We'll keep the screws because I might need them for uh, when I go to get the serial port. Okay, so this is self-explanatory. It just goes back on. You just screw it back down. Oh, no. Oh, fuck. I made a, a terrible boo-boo. So the, the connector for the fan is trapped with this heat sink here. So I'm going to have to try to get that out of there. Oh, fuck. Oops. 
if they got that without damaging the cable. I think it's all right. We'll know when the system boots on. I'll have I'll boot without the cover, and th hopefully the CPU fan still spins. And just like that, the, f the CPU fan has been put back on. It's still connected. Still connected. We didn't disconnect it when we first removed it. Um, it hopefully, it, sh it should be all right. Uh, I will note uh, when you take this out, you could I could have dusted it out. However, this this fan is not really that dusty. It was a pretty clean unit. I'll go ahead and spray a couple sprays of the of the uh, canned air into the heat sink fan, just if there is any dust in there. But uh, yeah, that's another thing to note. When you have a part, you might as well dust it out, right? Okay, I just sprayed a couple squirts, dust, dusted out. It wasn't really that dusty to begin with. So I think we got everything physically done with the unit, okay? So we upgraded the RAM, 32 gig DDR4 RAM. So we went from eight gig to 32 gig. We add an M.2 NVMe drive, one terabyte SSD. It did not come with storage uh, when I bought it. Like I said, when you get these units used, sometimes they'll come stores, sometimes they don't. It just depends. Since I got this from my, my previous employer, they do data eradication, so they have to wipe the drives that are in it. And mostly they dispose of the drives when they're done. So you have to provide your own drive, which is fine because I was going to put a better drive in it anyway. Uh, I could reinstall the uh, Caddy, the 2.5-inch uh, uh, SATA Caddy. Right here. However, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell you why. Reason I'm not going to do it is if I leave it off, it it provides a little bit more airflow in here, kind of so you don't have so many things blocking the air. So it'll help keep this NVMe drive maybe a little bit more cooler. Okay. Whereas if you put this in there, that can keep some of the heat down next to that NVMe drive. So since I'm not going to have a SATA drive in here or you know a regular 2.5 inch laptop hard drive in it. Um, there's no need to, ha to actually have that bracket in it. So I will keep this out of the machine and I'll just put this with, with the screw. I want to keep the screws. I'll keep it with the screw in a little, little Ziploc bag and I'll put it in storage. Um, so if you put an uh, M.2 drive in here and you don't, you're not also going to put a 2.5 inch drive, take that caddy out. Okay. Get you a little bit better airflow in there. Okay. So I think we did everything there. Oh, the old CPU, I'll show you, I'll show you guys that here. In a second, I'll clean up more and then I'll put it away in the baggie. So here's the old CPU. Um, like I said, it's a uh, i5 6500T, 2.5 gigahertz. So I'll go ahead and clean that up a little bit more and I'll put it in this uh, little anti-static baggie.
There's the old CPU. I'll put it in storage. Notice how I hold the CPU. You hold it from the edges. You don't want to touch it from the bottom, okay? Oh, third display port. Just put it in the baggie with the screws. Okay, so now I'm going to clean up the workbench here. We got all the physical stuff done, so I'm putting some stuff away. Put the cap back on your ISO alcohol. That's important. And then this, the the remaining ISO alk that you have in the little cup, you want to dump that in a sink and then run some water for a little while. Just get it down the drain, get it out of here. This is flammable. It also evaporates. So we'll go ahead and take care of that. Of course, before turning on a computer, stuff like that, you will want to get rid of this ISO alk. Because, you know, when you turn on a computer, what can happen? A little spark from the switch or whatever. So just to be safe, we'll get the ISO alk disposed of. We're done with it for now. I'll show you guys the power adapter and explain the power adapter. And then we'll do an initial post, make sure the unit actually boots up, sees the CPU, sees the RAM, and sees the SSD. And then we'll run Memtest 86 to test the RAM. Then we'll proceed to our Windows 10 installation to install the operating system. And then we'll get the drivers and everything else taken care of. So stay put, guys. I'll go ahead and clean up the workbench, and then we'll go ahead and do an initial boot. And we'll do the initial boot with the cover off just so I can examine Make sure that the heatsink fan is still working properly. Nothing's, you know, no funny business, okay? Okay, guys, so I got a keyboard out and a mouse. Got them connected. Just connect them to front port USB 3.0 headers. Now, when you go to put the cover back on, you want to make sure you take those uh, out, including the little mouse receiver, because that will interfere with it when you're putting the cover back on. Now, let me tell you guys about the power adapter. So this unit takes standard 65-watt Lenovo power adapters for their laptops, such as their ThinkPads. So this right here is a square connector Lenovo laptop charger. That's what these take. So this model number is, let me take, let me look here. It's an ADP-65FD um, space B, okay? And it outputs 20 volts at 3.25 amps, okay? And like I said, it's a 65 watt. And I'll take a picture of this later and overlay it for you guys. So you guys are aware, like I said, you just wanna make sure you have a 65 watt uh, yellow square Lenovo laptop charger. That's pretty much the specifications for it, okay? So I'll go ahead and plug this unit in. I have a good old trusty Dell L100 USB keyboard. I'll be uh, explaining uh, spare keyboards later, but this right here is one of, one of the best uh, rubber dome keyboards. Dell makes really solid rubber dome keyboards. I just use these for spare keyboards, and uh, these are great keyboards here. So I got a good old trusty Dell L100 keyboard hooked up, and I got a mouse. We'll go ahead and boot this up. We'll see if it posts. Also, another thing, we'll also got, want to check CPU thermals. Make sure we had a good thermal application. If we see some really crazy, you know, CPU temps, you know, sitting in the BIOS or even really in Memtest A6, might have got to scratch my head a little bit and think, hmm, oh, maybe that thermal compound was a little bit too much or too little, okay? So that's another thing you want. Whenever you change out the CPU or replace the thermal compound, you want to check your CPU thermals. Make sure everything is kosher there. So I'll go ahead and connect the adapter, plug it in. We'll post this system, see if it sees the new CPU and the upgraded RAM. It'll probably bitch at us because we uh, upgrade the RAM. Usually, you know, BIOS is say, hey, you changed, you changed out the memory, and you just have to continue on that. So let's go ahead and hook it up. So we have power applied. Oh, another thing I gotta do, hook up the uh, monitor. So this, this monitor does support DisplayPort, so that's a good thing. We'll have to go ahead and hook up uh, hook up the monitor. This has DisplayPort HDMI and VGA available, which is nice. 
See, whenever you have a workbench, you always want to have a monitor that supports the display port, okay? Oh, look at that. Lenovo on the screen. I don't know how well you guys can see that on camera. The computer is indeed on. The CPU fan is spinning. It's very quiet. You guys can listen to that. I have the mic right next to it, so if you hear it, that explains it. So, the CPU did post. Now it's probably going to complain that it doesn't have a bootloader. Yep, Intel boot agent went right in. So, I don't know how well you guys can see that, but the system posted, okay? That's the most critical thing. Get it to post. That means our RAM is okay, and our CPU is okay. So, I didn't get a fake CPU. Show an error, operating system not found, that's normal. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it off. You gotta be very careful. The The power button is just this little uh, green LED that lights up, okay? So, like I said, guys, the uh, heat sink fan was indeed spinning, and it was pretty much quiet. It made the noise that's supposed to make, so everything is kosher there in the system post, okay? So now, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the BIOS and see what the BIOS reports, okay? So we'll turn it back on. And to get in the BIOS, as the unit is booting up and you have a keyboard attached, you're just going to keep hitting on the enter button, okay? Okay, and then right here, you have escape to resume normal startup. F1 to enter the BIOS SEP utility. So I'll do F1, and as you guys can see, probably not very well, we are in the BIOS. I will adjust the camera. So guys, we are in the BIOS now, okay? Very simple BIOS. This does support UEFI, but doesn't have a fancy BIOS. These machines are mostly used in corporate and enterprise environments, you know, businesses. So they're not worried about all those, all the fancy ass features, you know what I'm saying? They just want, a, they just want solid workstations. So we tap on system summary, and as you guys can see, the CPU now reports an Intel Core i7 6700T at 2.8 gigahertz. Four cores, 32 gig of RAM. So look, installed memory. It sees our RAM. It sees it running at 2133, which is fine because like I said, the CPU memory controller can only go up to DDR, DDR4 2133. So it's gonna downclock the RAM. Our onboard video is integrated graphics. Onboard audio is enabled. The CPU fan says it's operating. And as you guys will also see, you have M.2 NVMe, and it does report Samsung SSD 970 EVO plus one terabyte. Awesome. So, so far, everything is a success. We also see that our mouse is working. See, I'm moving the mouse around. The mouse works and functions. Awesome. So that is pretty much that. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here, load optimal defaults, hit yes. Okay, and what that does is that resets everything, the factory default, even though we replaced the BIOS battery, I recommend doing this anyway. So we're gonna save changes and exit. Yes, and then when it reboots, we're gonna go back in the BIOS and we are going to set the date and time. It doesn't have to be dead on, but you want it to be relatively close. Like I said, when you replace the battery, it will reset the date and time, so we, we're definitely gonna need to do that. So as it's booting, just tap on enter. It does take a little while. It's normal. And F1. We're back into here. So we got system time and date. And as you can see, it says that it is midnight of January 1st, 2015. Well, that is not correct. So we're going to have to update that. Now, this will take 24-hour time. So when you enter these in, if you're in the U.S., you're used to 12-digit time. So if it's 1 o'clock, it would be 13 o'clock. Okay. So let me go ahead and look at my phone and we'll get this updated. So the time is 12.51, I'm in luck. The date is 12.15, we'll hit escape, escape. Uh, no, we wanna save. 
go over to exit, save changes and exit, yes. Okay, so I just updated the time, the date and time. So now it's not saying it's 2015, because it's not 2015. The unit will reboot. Just keep hitting enter. And this enter, now if you see this number down here counting down, you want to press enter to pause it. Okay, otherwise it will just continue booting, okay? But see that number's not counting down? So this gives you various options. I, I like this. So escape just means, hey, just continue normal boot up. F1, go to BIOS. F10, diagnose hardware. Basically, Lenovo has a built-in UEFI diagnostics um, program where you can test various things, which we'll go ahead and go into that, check that out. And you have F12 to choose a different boot option, and you have Control-P to enter your Intel AMT for your Intel vPro, okay? Which we will want to go into that later, factory reset it, and then get it configured for our specific um, configuration. So we're going to go ahead. We, we're, um, I'll go into BIOS and check some additional things in there, but also I want to diagnose hardware as well. So let's go ahead and go to that really quick. So that's F10. I want to show you guys what that looks like. That takes, you know, a little while to boot up. So as you see in here, this is really cool. This 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 gives you various things you can diagnose, and it's just built in to the fucking the BIOS, you know, built in. So you have CPU. You can run that. Just a quick test. And you can select different options. And that will just do a quick test of the CPU. Very cool. This is built-in built in stuff. So you might as well come in here and play with it, you know? And I could do extended tests, stuff like that, off camera, you know? I don't want to chew up a whole lot of time, but I did want to show you guys, you know, the various options you have available on these um, tiny clients. It's pretty cool. So as you see, it does report the i7-6700T. Look at that. Passed. Everything passed with flying colors. Pretty neat. We'll escape to go back home. And we can test other things. You can even test keyboards, <laughs> which is pretty cool. So we can also test display. I'm not too worried about that. We can test motherboard. We can test memory. Let's go ahead and test memory. Although the recommended way of testing memory is we'll run memtest86 and so we'll do a proper test on the RAM. But we'll just do a quick test here, make sure nothing's gonna blow up or you know explode so I wonder how long this takes so this takes a little longer so it's saying it'll take roughly 11 minutes I don't know if I like that <laughs> but this is a cool little you know built-in built-in thing you can use I like it. Unit's dead silent. Unit hasn't crashed yet or blown up. Uh, we will have to check the thermals, though. I don't think this reports the thermals. That would have been nice if it, re if it reported the thermals. Haven't heard any beeps or anything. I don't know if this utility does that or not. But, uh, hey. We'll test it out, you know. So you can see the unit's just over there running. You can see the green LED. Unit's pretty dead silent. I mean, this is this is a very quiet unit. We're not pushing it hard or anything right now, but still, very quiet unit. Um, another thing, I, I, put, I could put this on a kilowatt meter, which I may do later, so we can monitor power usage. Hopefully, I remember to do that. That would be pretty neat to... to uh, check out I would I would think so this does this is not a very quick test <laughs> it takes a little while to uh to process so as you guys can see the RAM passed in Lenovo's diagnostics we just did a quick test that's good um However, like I said, we'll do a proper RAM test here in a little bit. 
I had enough time to go grab myself a fresh Coca-Cola. <laughs> Can you believe that? So we'll go ahead and escape back to the home, and then we'll go ahead and uh, we'll see if we can test the motherboard and maybe some other things really quick. Hopefully, if it don't take too long, we'll go ahead and do those. Just might as well, you know, make sure stuff is uh, not reporting any errors or anything. So everything passed on the motherboard. Okay. PCI Express, not sure what it can test there. There's not really anything really hooked up, not passed. Storage, I'm not sure what it's gonna do here, if it's gonna run a smart test or what it's gonna do, but we'll see here. Controller status, smart temperature, spare space, and reliability. Huh. Okay. Let's see what it says. As you guys can see all the way at the top, it does see the NVMe drive. See at the top there, guys? Where it says storage one, Samsung SSD 970 Evo Plus 1 terabyte. That's pretty cool. And now the hard drive activity light is blinking on the computer really rapidly. So it is doing something. <laughs> I'm not sure what it's reading because it hasn't been allocated. But the hard drive activity light is blinking rapidly right now, guys. Passed. Everything passed. Okay. I don't know if that formatted the hard drive or what it did. But uh, interesting. Interesting. Then we have system information with F1, which is very nice. They give you a nice mem menu, shows you the BIOS version. We'll make sure the BIOS version is the latest and greatest. It's not too badly outdated, 2021, so that's not bad. Get serial number. You can pop in the serial number over on Lenovo's support page and get all the information about the unit, how it was default configura configurated when the, pre the previous owner bought it, which would have been a business, you know, a company. And uh, this did have a just a regular 2.5 inch, like 180 gig hard drive, <laughs> and it had 8 gig of RAM with an i5 6500T. So, you know, pretty uh, pretty bottom. You know what I'm saying? Pretty pretty uh, basic. So we really we're maxing this unit out. Let me set my Coca-Cola down so I can navigate through the keyboard here. So you can export the system information as well with F2. You would have to have a drive hooked up though. So if you go over, you can scroll down. It shows the i7 6700T, which is great. You can, uh, oops, go down, look at the CPU information. So like I said right here, shows the 6700T. I'll show you everything about it. Enabled threads, so see, eight threads. It will show you all the instruction, instruction sets. It will show you the cache. So we do have that eight eight megabytes of cache. So that's an upgrade from the six megabytes of the previous CPU. Um, you have display. It even shows the display, what resolution it's running at, display type, Acer. I mean, so this is reading everything. You got keyboard. It just says uh, USB keyboard. A manufacturer Logitech. Huh. It's not a Logitech keyboard, it's a Dell L100, but maybe that's the uh, chipset they're using on it. Oh, here we go. Dell vendor identifier. <laughs> it's, this is kind of this kind of cool. This is all built into the, the system, guys. I haven't booted a driver or anything. This is all built in. I mean, you gotta admit, this is pretty, pretty neat. I think it's neat. Got memory. So you got we got our total. 32 gig of RAM, so it sees, all, sees our 32 gig, DDR4. JDET manufactures 1315, doesn't really show anything else. Shows what's running at, 2133, that's correct. Shows the part number and serial numbers, origin. So it doesn't report crucial. Let 
We got our motherboard information. Pretty basic stuff there, nothing really, nothing really crazy there. We got mouse, a Logitech USB receiver. Yep, this is a Logitech um, M510 mouse. Sees that, PCI Express. Display video controller storage. This is pretty cool. This shows a lot of information about the NVMe drive. It says it's NVMe. Shows the physical block size. Non-rotating. Firmware that's currently running on it. Neat. Pretty neat. So anyway, guys. We'll go ahead and reboot the system back in the BIOS. I want to go through the BIOS, change some things that may need to be changed, like maybe turn on hyper-threading, make sure that uh, SATA is set to HCI, although we don't have a SATA drive in here, so that's kind of mute. Don't have to worry about that. But we'll go through the BIOS, check a few things, and then I want to go into the AMT management, make sure that has been factory resetted. If not, I'll have to reset, figure out how to reset that. So before I install the OS or do anything, I want to make sure that's resetted. Okay. And then we're going to go ahead and, and I'll hook up my uh, my Ventoy drive and we'll boot Memtest A6 and fully test the RAM, which I believe will pass. I mean, it's crucial RAM, so it's most likely to pass. And then we'll go ahead and install Windows 10. Okay, guys? So I'll just go ahead and uh, turn the unit off. Is there a way to... Yes, I want to run. I want to exit. There we go. Didn't, ha didn't have to turn the unit off. Look at that. Now, does it reboot? It re does reboot. Like I said, when you guys have a monitor in your workshop, you want to have one that has DisplayPort. You really want to have one that has DisplayPort. And also VGA. And this has it. This has everything. It, it has... Uh, so that's counting down. You want to press Enter to pause that. There we go. I wish they didn't have that, that countdown thing. I think that's kind of silly, okay? So Lenovo, if you can just make this stay up here until the user does something, that'd be awesome. So if you see that number counting down, all you gotta do is just press enter once and that will pause it right away, okay? So we'll go into the BIOS, F1. And I'm gonna go ahead and check some things. So we got uh, our BIOS version, we'll update that later. Machine type. We have our license, our... Uh, like I said, your your Windows 10 Pro, your license key will be embedded into the BIOS, into the UEFI, even if you factory reset the BIOS. It's tied to this unit. It's an OEM license. So if you go ahead and install a fresh install of Windows 10, boop, it will see that license and boom, activate it. So there's no reason at all to pirate it, pirate on these machines. Okay, guys? And that's that's another good thing about these machines is when you go to buy them, you don't have to worry about that. Oh, I didn't mean that. that. <laughs> Keep that in English. <laughs> but uh, that's a neat thing, okay? So we got devices, USB setup, USB support, legacy, virtual, KBC. I don't know. I'll just leave that defaults. Generation front. And this is where you can enable, disable USB ports. ATA, SATA controllers enabled, SATA drive 1 enabled, NVMe drives enabled, enabled. SATA is HCI already. Nice. Hard disk pre-delay is disabled. So those defaults already look pretty good. Got video setup. Active video says auto. Uh, it's our, always going to be the integrated display, but we'll just keep that at auto. Audio setup. Internal speakers, speakers enabled and onboard audio is enabled. We'll keep those. Like I said, this is going to be a workbench PC, so it's not like I'm going to hook up a DAC or anything. I could, but I'm not too concerned about being onboard real tech audio. You know, this isn't my main computer or anything. Network setup, onboard Ethernet controllers enabled, boot agent, PXC. We're going to go ahead and disable the boot agent for now. That that will just speed up the boot process. If you keep that on there, every time you boot the computer, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be looking for a PXC server, okay, where you can boot over the network. Unless you're doing that, you don't need to have that enabled. It just, it, all it does is add delay to your, to your startup, okay? That might be something I, I play with later on. I do want to have a PXC server and boot over the network. So that's something that I'll be able to test later on with this unit. And it's great to have these units. You can do so much stuff with them. 
you know, you can experiment, do, you know, run VMs, lab and stuff. These, these are nice little units to have. So here's the network stacks. Those are disabled. But if you're going to do PXC, you'd want to go in there. PCI Express, ASPM supports disabled. Configure ASPM automatically according to what the attached device supports in each PSR. We'll just leave that default. I don't really have any PCI Express things in here. CPU. So hyperthreading is enabled. Core multiprocessing. Virtualization technology. We're going to go ahead and enable that. VTD is disabled by default. I'm going to... Uh, I might enable that. Turbo mode's enabled. That's good. But yeah, you want to enable the virtualization technology if you ever plan to run VMs on this. I By default, this is disabled. I'm going to keep it disabled for now. This is mainly for virtualization. So I ain't going to worry about that. Intel manage, management... Okay, so here's where you can reset the uh, Intel management. So we're going to do that. And it shows the current firmware, which when we go to when we go to discuss uh, Intel V Pro and AMT and you know ME, the management in engine, we'll discuss updating the firmware and how this all works. But we do want to reset this, so. If it is enabled, Intel R management settings will reset the default. The index password will also reset. You want to do this on these units, okay? So we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. If you're not going to use this, if you don't, if you don't plan on remotely controlling these units with IP, like kind of like an IPMI, disable it, okay? So you want to fully disable it, or you can also put in a CPU that doesn't support VPro, okay? But stay tuned. I will be making a video on this, on Intel V Pro and AMT. You'll want to know about it. If you have a unit that that has a sticker that says V Pro enabled, you're gonna want to know what that is, okay? Because it can be a security. It can be a big security hole if you don't know, don't know what it is, and you don't configure it properly, okay? So we'll go ahead and set that like that. Sub support CPU. Not sure what that is. Dust shield alert. We'll keep that disabled. We'll go over to power. After power loss, do the last state. We'll just say stay off. Hands power saving mode. Nope. Smart power on. Uh, this looks like just a shortcut. If you press Alt-P, it'll, it'll turn on the computer. However, this will keep the... Uh, I believe this will keep the USB port always on. I believe. So if you want to charge your phone, that might be nice to keep on. So I'll go ahead and keep it on. But if you're concerned about power usage, you can go ahead and disable that. So when you have the computer off, you might have less power usage. Intelligent cooling engine. Better acoustic performance. Oh. We'll just keep it at defaults. Automatic power on. Wake on LAN. If you want to have wake on LAN enabled, we'll just keep it at automatic. Wake up alarm. We'll just keep that stuff to defaults. Security. You can set an, an admin password for the BIOS. Allow flashing BIOS provision requirement. Windows UEFI firmware update enabled. USB protection. Smart USB protection could block copying data from the computer to USB storage device in Windows. This is more, more something for corporate environments. Okay, so the camera went off. I'm not sure how much we lost there. But I'm in the security tab now. Um, I kept the audio just so you guys can hear me discussing uh, the various options and what they do. So smart USB protection. This is something more for a corporate environment where you can disable somebody coming in, popping in a flash drive, and you know taking off with some of your company data. However, if they go into the BIOS, they'll be able to disable it. But if you see, obviously... If you're at work, if you see somebody in a BIOS, it's going to throw a major red flag. So, you know, I don't think people are going to do that. But, you know, never know. Hard disk password, no. Fingerprint setup. 
Huh, fingerprint setup. Well, this doesn't really have a system secure boot. So that's disabled by default. We'll just go ahead and keep that disabled. I'm not too concerned about secure boot. Network office locker setup. Trusty intrusion detection. Nah. We got startup primary boot sequence. So here's where you can configure your default uh, boot drives. Um, I will do this uh, later on. So by default, you want to have this at the top, okay? So I want this. How do we change this? Use up down there as a select device. Plus and minus. I'm using the plus, but it's not going anywhere. Oh, there we go. USB key. M.2 SATA. I'm not too concerned about that. We'll do X. So that gets rid of that. The SATA drive. We don't have a SATA drive in there. Network. USB hard drive, USB CD-ROM, other device. So by default, it's going to try to boot from the NVMe drive. Second, it's going to try to boot from a USB hard drive. And then I think that's a floppy disk drive. So we'll keep it like that, okay? We'll escape. All Mac boot sequence. Oh, when a communications device boots up the system. We'll just keep that like that. CSM compatibility. To support non-UFI operating systems. We'll keep that on because I do boot uh, a lot of non-UEFI uh, uh, operating systems off of this as well. Boot mode on, boot legacy first. UEFI first, okay? Boot with numlock on, yes. Keyboard operation enabled. Option keys. Enabled, cool. So now we're gonna save changes and exit, yes. So now the BIOS has been fully configured. Will the system boot back on? Yes, it will. <laughs> So we configured the BIOS. The next thing I want to do is I want to go in and make sure that the uh, found unconfigure of Intel management interface. Continue with unconfiguration, yes. Unconfiguration and process, okay. That's good. That will allow me when I go into set it up later, we got a clean slate. It's not configured to the previous company. Because I guarantee you, this was in a corporate environment. ME would have, would have been configured. Okay. So it went through and unconfigured the management interface. Cool. Great. So now this unit's like a brand new system. Okay. And it will have the default password now, which is nice. That's something you guys want to do, okay? So you go into BIOS to uh, fully reset that and let that do its thing. So now I want to, uh, oops, I probably missed it. <laughs> no operating system found. So now I want to boot the system off, so I'll just turn it off. I'm going to go ahead and put the cover back on the unit because we know the unit's all ready to go. And then I'm going to pop in my Ventoy drive, and we're going to boot Memtest 86 Pro, Okay. We're going to test the RAM, okay? So that's the next stage of the game. I now know that the Intel ME, the AMT, that's all been factory reset now, so I'm good on that. I don't have to go into the MBEX uh, configuration panel. That will be for that video, okay, guys? I won't, I'm not going to go into that on this video. But, but stay tuned. You guys will want to see that video. If you have a system that has vPro, you're going to want to see that video, okay? So... We'll go ahead and put the cover back on and get on with this.
that screw go? <laughs> Here it is. Ooh, she's a little warm. Stayed off. That's good. Okay, I plugged the unit back in. It stayed off, which is good. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out my Ventoy drive. I will be having a video about Ventoy coming later on. We had a couple uh, setbacks that delayed me making the video, but I will be releasing the video explain what Ventoy is. You guys definitely want to check that out when I do that. That's going to be a cool video. So I'll go ahead and hook that up. We'll go ahead and boot into Ventoy and then we're going to boot Memtest 86 Pro and test out the RAM. So what I did was I tapped on enter and pressed. When you tap on enter, it's going to bring this up. The, notice how the thing's not moving around. Then the next thing I tapped on was 12. This will allow you to, to select your boot device that you want to boot from temporarily. So this part is important. We'll go down to USB hard drive where it says Sabrent. That is my Ventoy drive. And we're going to select UEFI and hit enter. This will boot. Ventoy in UEFI mode. Secure boot disabled. Awesome. So we are now in Ventoy. Okay. And you'll notice down here it says UEFI. So we are indeed booted with UEFI, which is good. We're going to go down to Memtest 86 Pro. Hit enter. We're going to run Memtest 86 Pro version 10.0 IMG. Enter. So now Memtest 86 Pro is going to boot up. There we go. We'll go ahead and go over to config. Hit enter. There we go. Memtest. Oops. Sorry. Hit the hit the tripod. There we go. So Memtest 86 Pro is fully booted. Do an F12 for screenshot. So as you can see, we have our Intel Core i7 6700T, 2.0 gigahertz. Clocked at 2.2.7 gigahertz right now. Um, Turbo is up to 3.4. Ooh, the unit's getting a little bit louder. It's making a little bit of noise. It's working. We have our CPU temperature right now at 59 degrees Celsius. A little warm, but not too concerning yet. That's pretty normal. And also when you're in Memtest A6, it doesn't always properly report the CPU temp. Sometimes it can be a little bit off. And also when you go to actually run the Memtest test, since it's doing a lot of patterns and stuff against the RAM, it does use a little bit of CPU. You know, it's not going to fully peg the CPU, but it does work the CPU a little bit. So we have our eight megabytes of layer three cache from our CPU, which is correct. It sees our 32 gig of RAM. It shows the current latency of it. 
It's not ECC RAM. You can view your detailed SPD, SPD. And as you guys can see right there, it shows the two crucial modules. So those are reporting correctly. Pretty cool. And you could save that to file. I mean, when you have... Uh, When you have Memtest A6 Pro, it's it can do so much so much stuff. We memory usage, ECC pooling. We're not using ECC pooling. Save system inf information summary to file. Um, so we did that. So we can also do RAM benchmarking. So we'll go ahead and do that. Just make sure the RAM is working and nothing's crashing here. Test complete. That's how fast our RAM's going. We'll go back. We'll change this to uh, change that to right now. Start that test. Now we're testing the right speed. Okay, so that's a little, <laughs> that's a little weird for right based on block size. Go ahead and save that. Okay. And now we're going to actually start start the test. So now, as you guys can see, it's going to run the MIM test, okay? Now, you wanna do this whenever you get a system, whenever you change out the RAM or upgrade the RAM. You always wanna make sure your RAM is, is good. This is just a good preventive measurement. Just do it, okay? So we see our CPU is clocked at 2.7 gigahertz, 62 degrees Celsius, so, a little warm, but nothing, nothing crazy. You know, not saying, "Oh my God, that's 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 bad." We got we got a problem. A little bit, a little bit toastier than I, I'd like to see, but not too terrible. I will look up what what the uh, what the uh, T junction temp of this CPU is. I believe it's eighty degrees Celsius, so we should be okay. And if it's still clocked at 2.7 gigahertz, that's that's fine. 66 degrees Celsius, jumped a little bit. Shows the speed of our RAM. We got 32 gig in there, run at 19 gigabytes a second. It does show we have 17, 17, 7, 17, 39 timings, crucial technology. So it's now testing, guys. And as you guys can see at the top, this is the pro version. Shows our 6700T. So our CPU does work as well. Awesome. So I'm going to let this run. This is going to probably take an hour or two to run. We've got 32 gig of RAM here, so it'll take a little while. I did test that 8 gig of RAM that was in this before. It was a 8 gig module from Samsung, and it did pass as well. So I got some spare RAM, you know. But we'll let that run. And we'll get back with the results. Okay, guys. So MemTest86 has finally completed. It took about four and a half hours to complete, which is pretty crazy, right? But we were testing 32 gig of RAM there. So this 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 pass, it does, does take a while to do these tests because it will do four different passes. So it's really in-depth. So as you guys can see, we did pass MemTest86. So that means our RAM is good, which I had high confidence. I mean, it's crucial RAM. We're not likely to have any issues if we buy quality RAM. However, I did see a potential issue. I noticed that our thermals were looking a bit hot. And most tests, it was running in the 70 degree range, like 75, 77 degree. I've seen it go up to 82 degrees Celsius, which, ugh. That's not good. So it could just be MemTest 86. You know, the thermal CPU temps aren't always accurate on MemTest 86. Could be because maybe some of the tests were actually really working the CPU. Um, but we're going to investigate the CPU temp once we get Windows installed and we can diagnose it further, see if we do have a thermal issue. If we do have a thermal issue, I'll take the heat sink back off and reapply thermal compound. I'll do that off camera, of course, because I'm not going to bore you with doing that whole process again. 
but I'm thinking I probably put a bit too much thermal compound on because the pea size that I put on there was kind of big. I should have ticked a toothpick and took a little bit more off, but um, we will fix that later on. We'll diagnose that later. But like I said, whenever you change out a heat sink or reapply thermal compound, uh, you definitely want to monitor your thermals for a day or two. And also stress the CPU. Make sure your thermals are looking okay. So the thermals were not looking okay here, but we'll check, we'll look into that later. So our RAM passed. We'll just hit enter to continue. And as you can see right here, CPU temperature. Min of 59, max of 82, average of 73 degrees Celsius. So, yeah. We got a problem there. It took four and a half hours to complete. And we had uh, no fails. And I do want to save this report, so I'm just going to hit Y. And there we go. It will write it to the disk. So Memtest 86 is all done. So we're now going to exit. Shut down. There we go. The system will shut down. Now, when Memtest was running, the fan on this did kick up. I mean, this system, you could start to hear the fan. I mean, she was working. So, I may have to reapply the thermal compound. But we'll handle that here in a little bit. Okay, so now we're going to start the unit again. And this time we're going to um, boot into the Windows 10 installation ISO. Okay? So, we're going to install Windows 10 now. So, go ahead and turn the unit back on. And... Once it boots up here, keep tapping on enter. Okay, and now we'll do F12 to choose our temporary startup device. Okay, and if that's a little bit blurry, I'll fix it for you, bud, guys. There we go. So now we'll go down to UEFI. This is very important. You want to install Windows 10 via UEFI. If your system supports it, do it. So UEFI Sabrent. And that should boot us into our vent toy. And it does. Okay, so now we're going to go down to... So see, we have various operating systems on here. We'll go down to Windows 10 and Windows 10 22H2. Okay, that's the latest version, 64-bit. Boot in normal mode. And there we go. Like I said, this should pick up the uh, Windows 10 Pro key. Okay. Hope you guys can see that okay. I know there's a little bit of a glare. There's our mouse work. Our mouse works, so that's good. So English, United States, English, United States, US. We'll hit next. We're going to go ahead and click install now. Set up a starting. Okay, so we have our terms of service. We'll just hit I accept. Next. Custom install, Windows only. Okay, and now we have some drives here. So we're going to want to go with the one terabyte drive, unallocated. You don't want to mess with your Vintoy drives. I know it presents them. You don't want to mess with your Vintoy drives. So right here, drive zero, unallocated space. One terabyte, we'll click on that, we'll click a new, apply. Yep. There we go. And now it creates the proper system partitions and everything. You always want to click on that new to do that. So now we just we have our main partition three here, one terabyte, we'll click next. And now it's going to install Windows 10 onto our 970 Pro SSD. And the hard drive TV light is blinking rapidly on the system right now. So it's now going to copy over. It should be relatively fast because this is 
a, you know, M.2 SSD. They're both M.2 SSDs. We're going over a 5, gigahertz, five um, gigabit USB bus, though, so won't be as fast as if I was going over a 10 gigabit USB bus, but still, you could see it's going relatively fast. The fan in this system is definitely kicking up. I'll let you guys listen. So I don't know how well you guys can hear the noise of that system, but we're definitely going to have to check our uh, thermals. We'll investigate that later. Not too concerned, you know, 70 and 80 degrees, 80 degrees Celsius. The CPU is okay. It's not going to damage the CPU. It's just not going to perform good. And plus, <laughs> your thermals are going to be crazy and your fan's going to get rubbed up. So there we go. It's installing updates, going through the process here. We'll let it keep going, finishing up. Windows needs to restart. We'll go ahead and click restart now. Or I'll just let it do it by itself. It should automatically boot the M.2 drive because remember we changed our boot order. So shouldn't throw us back into Ventoy. Okay, let's see here. Hard drive to light is blinking. That's good. This always takes a, a few seconds. Okay, that's a good sign. That's a very good sign. The hard drive at light is definitely blinking now. Now, I do not have this hooked up to internet yet, which that's a good thing. This is not hooked up. The networking is not hooked up on this computer yet. That says getting ready. Probably should clean off the screen, right? <laughs> it, it shows up a lot worse on camera. Like, in real life, you have to be right up on top of the monitor to see the dust. But <laughs> the, the camera really shows it bad. So, hard drive tail light is still blinking, so it's, it's, it's definitely doing something. It's working. Probably doesn't like the CPU being so toasty. <laughs> But uh, we'll address that. Okay. To be late, it's still blinking. I wish I had multiple cameras so I can do multi cam. But we're working on it day by day, you know. Okay, so we're starting again. That's that's completely fine. We're starting again. Maybe. Okay, power light is on. Is it going to come online? Hard rate tail light's blinking again. See what happens. Okay, loading again. Hopefully the uh, <laughs> system doesn't shut down for overheating or anything while it's installing Windows. That wouldn't be ideal. Okay, just a moment. Like I said, computers nowadays, if the CPU was in critical, um, if the thermals were critical on the, on the CPU, like it was overheating, it will tell the system to shut down to protect, it, protect itself. Trust me, computers are smart nowadays. It will shut down if it's too hot, okay? So we haven't had it shut down during the entire MEM test. So wall right. Like I said, I will address the thermal issue because, you know, that's not acceptable for me. I do professional professional job. I want it done right. Okay, let's start with region. So United States. Yes. Just a moment. Is this the right keyboard? United States. Yes. Do you want to add a second keyboard? Nope. Skip. Now it says, please connect to internet so we can set up a Microsoft account and tie your computer to my, a Microsoft account. No. Hell no. You don't want to do it that way. 
So we're going to say, I don't have internet. Okay. And it's going to keep saying, well, if you don't have internet, you can't do this. You can't do that. We're going to limit you, blah, blah, blah. So they're going to keep pushing you to connect, connect to the internet. So you are forced to sign in to a Microsoft account. But we're going to say no. So you click continue with limited setup. Now it's going to say who's going to use this PC. GTA XL, next. And we're going to create a password on it. It wants a uh, security question. <laughs> okay, so I did the security questions. Had to cut them out. Okay, so a lot of this stuff you're going to want to turn off. So you want to keep location for weather and stuff. So diagnostic data, no. Tailored experience, no. Find my device, no. Inking, advertising, no. So we turn all these off. There's no scroll wheel with accept. And then we're going to say not now. Just a moment. Hi. We're getting everything ready for you. Yep, yep. Hard white tail light is blinking rapidly. This may take several minutes. Fine by me. Just... Don't overheat. <laughs> Don't turn off your PC. Ideally, you'd want this um, hooked up to a UPS. They weren't lying about taking several minutes, were they? Almost there. And look at that. Looks like we have Windows 10 on this machine. So I'm just going to click maybe later on that. I'm going to let it continue booting up because it's still doing some stuff in the background. Okay. I'm going to open up File Explorer and I'm going to eject the Ventoy drives. Maybe. Eject Sabrent. Oh yeah. Systems, system is definitely a Heating up. You guys hear that? <laughs> She's not happy. She is not happy. We are going to definitely address that. Okay. So we are in Windows 10. The hard drive activity light is still blinking. So it's still doing stuff in the background. So I'll let it do that. I'll let it calm down. And one of the first things we're going to want to do is we're going to want to go into group policy and disable automatic driver updates from Windows Update. And then what we'll want to do is we want to do Windows Updates. And then we'll also want to install our drivers. So we'll probably have to install our, uh, our drivers f first because otherwise when you go to connect the Ethernet cable, it's probably not going to pick it up, okay? It might, but it probably won't. So there's a bunch of stuff on here. You got news down here. All this all this garbage they include on here. This one's running pretty responsive though. Pretty smooth. So we'll do a couple tweaks. So I need to go get the flash drive that has all the uh drivers and stuff on it okay so I'm gonna go do that okay so I went and got the drivers put on the drive we'll go ahead and copy them over so we look right here workbench computer we're gonna go ahead and cut those over to we'll just put them right here on the desktop copy that over Ooh, that's going pretty oh there we go now it picked up I was going to say, 
That was a little bit concerning there for a second. Maybe. Cool. And we'll go ahead and eject this again. Eject saber. There you go. Okay. So we got all our drivers. Windows 10 64 bit. So we got all our drivers in here, guys. And I don't know how well you guys are going to see that. I know I'm recording the screen with a camera. Just please bear with it. I, I am going to get capture cards. Okay? That's in the works. So the first thing I, I would like to install would be the chipset driver. So we'll say yes. I accept. Next. Install. Next. Install. So usually the first thing you'll install will be a chipset driver. Open the driver set. Next. Install. Next. Extracting files. Hard drive activity light is blinking rapidly. That's a good sign. It means it's doing something. Okay. Finish. Finish. Okay, chipset driver should be installed. I'll go ahead and delete that. Okay, and then next thing I'd want to install would probably be the uh, the NIC. Let's go ahead and install that. Accept. Next. Install. Next. Install. Extracting files. Driver setup. Next. Next. Install. Lenovo has a quite a different uh, driver installation process here, don't they? Okay. And until LAN driver has been installed, we'll go ahead and delete that. Next thing, we got our HD graphics. I'm going to wait for that. Got a Wi Fi driver, but we don't have Wi Fi installed, so we don't need that. We got Rapid Storage Technology driver. Go ahead and install that. Next. Although this is mainly for if you have a SATA drive in there, so I don't really need to have this installed, but. Might as well. It's not going to really hurt anything. Okay. Got a Bluetooth driver. Don't think we need that either. We don't have a WLAN card in here. We got our Intel HD graphics. Um, now there's two different versions. There's. There's the one from Lenovo, and then there's the one from Intel. I'm going to install the one from Intel. Let's see how this works out for me. We'll see. <laughs> it should take it. It's for the right CPU. Hard drive activity light is rapidly blinking, so it's doing something. System is definitely kicking up. Right there. Intel graphics driver installer. Begin installation. I agree. We'll just click start. Installing new graphics driver. Okay. So this is the one I got directly from Intel for this particular uh, CPU. The CPU, you know, has integrated graphics. And to get the driver for your integrated graphics, you just go to the Intel Arc page for the CPU and click on Downloads, and it should link it there. But this had a much, much newer version of the graphics driver. Now, the, I'm not gaming on this unit, but it may bring support for newer codecs um, or even uh, 
Intel's um, hardware encoding. I, the name escapes me what it's called, but uh, that's my reason for getting the latest graphics driver instead of just using the one provided from Lenovo. We'll see what happens. Hopefully she don't blow up, right? It, it shouldn't. <laughs> Of course, we'll also go into device manager and make sure you know everything is accounted accounted for in there. Installing new graphics driver. Well, there goes the monitor. Just reset it, so that's a good thing. It's doing something. Installation complete. Reboot recommended. We will reboot it, just not right now. Okay. So we're gonna click finish. So it did install it, it didn't complain about it, so that's a good thing. So we can delete that. Intel management en engine driver, we'll go ahead and install that as well. Yes. Accept, next, install, install. Next, next, install. Okay, finish, finish. Nope. Intel management engine, engine firmware update. We definitely want to update it to the latest version. So this is 11.8.92.4249 corporate. Let's go ahead and run that. Hopefully this doesn't require internet to pull the latest version, but it could just be a utility that pulls the latest version. It is a utility. So Think Center ME firmware update utility. So we'll do that later when we have it connected to the internet. That's something you'll definitely want to do. You'll definitely want to update your firmware for that. Because that could be become a security hole. You got Intel OBGFX. That's a graphics driver, but I'm not going to mess with it. Unless I need it. You have, I'm not sure, this says a Lighton IO box COM port. I believe that's for our server port. We don't have it yet. So I'm going to delete that for now. We have our Realtek audio codec driver. So that's for our onboard audio. We'll go ahead and install that. And by the way, the speaker does work. Whenever these pop up, it's making noise. So our speaker still works, which is a good thing. I know, real tech, right? Ugh. This is a workbench computer. It's not my main computer. This isn't really going to be playing audio, period, really. <laughs> okay. Got the old-fashioned 1990s <laughs> install wizard for real tech. Look at that, guys. They still haven't updated that. Look at that. <laughs> ah, good old real tech. Next. Okay. Okay. Going by like butter. Man, I don't feel like taking this apart and redoing the heat sink. Why can't life be easy, right? No, I re will restart my computer later. Finish. And that is stuck on extracting files. There we go. Finish. Okay. So our real tech audio codec has been installed. We have... Realtek USB 2.0 and 3.0 card reader. This doesn't have a card reader that I'm aware of, so we're going to delete that. Now we have our Samsung NVMe driver. Since we have a Samsung SSD, you do want to install Samsung's NVMe driver. You do want to do this. This will increase your performance. So please do this. It's important, okay? Okay. It's going to now install the NVMe driver. No, I will restart my computer later. Finish. Okay. 
delete that. Now we're going to install Samsung Magician. Notice how I installed the NVMe driver first. That's important. What, yes? English? Hopefully this doesn't bitch that there's no internet connection, but we'll see. It's it's working. It's doing something. It's thinking about it. Okay, we'll hit next. Accept. Accept. We don't want a desktop icon. Nope. Install. Yeah, that fan is definitely revving up and down. That's not a good thing. We'll definitely uh have to take care of that. Okay, Samsung Magician is installing. Almost done. There we go. We're not going to launch it right now. I just want it to be installed. So there we go. Everything that needs to be installed for this system is installed. Go ahead and delete that. We'll go ahead and empty our recycle bin. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to do is I want to go into um, group policy and disable um, disable automatic driver updates from Windows Update. So Windows Update, in the background, whenever it runs, it will automatically update your drivers. You may be like, oh, that's a good thing. No, it's not. It can cause problems. Okay, so I disable that on um, all my systems. Okay. So what you do is you just hit the start button, type in run, and then you're going to do gpedit.msc. And then we go to computer configuration. And then we go to administrative. Administrative templates. And then we go to Windows components. And then we go to Windows update. And then in here, you're going to look for do not include drivers with Windows update double click it so I found it right here do not include drivers with Windows updates enable this policy to not include drivers with Windows quality updates double click that and then we'll enable it Hit apply okay so there we go now by default when we run Windows update it's not going to include drivers Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to restart the system. So it's restarting. Since we did all them drivers, you definitely want to do that before we proceed. And also, my Ventoy drive is not connected to the computer at all. So it should be strictly off the internal SSD now. So let's see how fast she boots. Not too shabby. We'll hit enter, and I gotta, of course, log in. Boom, we're right in. Look at that, guys. Not bad for an overheating computer, right? <laughs> so now, I'm going to get an Ethernet cable and hook this up to the internet. Then we're gonna run all the Windows updates and make sure it has it's fully updated then we'll clean the clean, remove any bloatware. Then we'll install our programs that we need. Okay.
Okay, so I hooked up an Ethernet cable. We're now connected to the internet. It's going to say over here, do you want to allow your PC to be discovered by other PCs and devices on this network? Yes, because this is a home network. If it's also a work network, you can do that. But if you're on like a public network, usually that's for like laptops. Like if you're at like a coffee shop, you would say no. Okay, so now it was able to pull down the uh, temperature. <laughs> And you see a bunch of bloatware. It's going to start loading stuff and getting acquainted here. First thing I want to do is I'm going to want to update the time. Okay. So right click, adjust date and time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click sync now. And you might want to click this a few times. I'm going to go ahead and change this to Eastern Time because right now it's on Pacific. And set time automatically. Set time zone automatically. No. Okay. We got Eastern Time. So now it shows 9.05 p.m., which is correct. Adjust daylight savings time, blah, blah, blah. That's additional calendars. So I can't do sync again, but I'm going to go ahead and do it again here. Sync now. There we go. So our time should now be accurate. That's important. Okay. So you want to do that on these when you do a fresh ins installation. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do our Windows updates. So you just hit start. You type in Windows update, and we do go ahead and run it. Just like that. Now it's going to check for updates, and it's going to, of course, they're going to nag you. They really want you to install Windows 11, but even if we wanted to, we can't on this system, so they can just screw off. So it takes a little while to check for updates, but I guarantee you there will be some available. So as you guys can see, there's plenty of Windows updates. However, we're not going to pull down any drivers, which is good. I'm just going to click exit on this little Windows 11 BS. Now notice it will say some settings are managed by your organization. That's because we went into group policy and modified some settings. While that runs, I'm going to go ahead and open up Device Manager and make sure all the drivers are in check. Okay, so there is an unknown device. So what I'm going to do with that is says there's no driver installed. So when you have a when you have a situation like this, you're going to look in device manager for any that have a an asterisk in a in a uh, yellow symbol, okay? That means hey, there's a problem with that device. It doesn't have its driver, something like that. What you'll do is you'll go over to details and you're going to get the hardware ID copy it, and you're going to paste it to a, a text document, and you're going to search it later, figure out what device it is, okay? That's the easiest way to find out what this device is that needs the driver. So everything else checks. Display drivers. We got Intel HD Graphics 530. That's good. Disk drives. We got our Samsung SSD 970 Evo. Audio. We have our Realtek. Everything else is being accounted for. Got our USB controller. We got our Samsung NVMe controller. We got our Intel Display Audio, which that's to send um, digital audio out via HDMI or DisplayPort. And then we have our trusted platform module, TPM 1.2, CPU, ports. Intel Active Management Technology, COM3. We got our Intel Ethernet NIC, our I-219LM. Uh, that's, that's working. Monitors. So everything's accounted for except that one unknown device. So we'll look that up here in a, here in a little bit.
And while that's running, I'll just do some little bit of cleanup work. Now, what I do with OneDrive is you can uninstall it, but on the next Windows update, it will come back on your system. So what I recommend you doing, if you don't use it, go into OneDrive settings and um, check off Start on Startup, and it will not start ever again. It will be installed, but it will not start up and sit in your uh, taskbar. I can uninstall some apps. 3D Viewer, we don't need that. Arms and Clock, App Installer, Calculator, Camera, Cortana, Feedback Hub, we don't need that. Get Help, Groove Music, we don't need that. HF, that's good to keep. Intel Graphics Command, Intel Rapid Storage. Mail and Calendar, we don't need that. Why do they tie Calendar together with Mail? Why? Why do you do that? Maps, they won't let you uninstall Maps. That's weird. Microsoft Edge, keep that. Edge Update, uh, OneDrive. You can't uninstall OneDrive, however, it will come right back. So I recommend you just leave it alone. Solitaire. Store, you can't get rid of that. Reality Portal. Movies and TV. This Office and OneNote that's on here is just like a, like an advertisement. It's like a trial thing. It's not real Office. You can tell by the size of it, too. That's not real Office. It's like an advertisement. I may put real Office on this system later on. Paint 3D. People, can't get rid of people, that's dumb. Photos, keep that, real tech audio, Samsung Magician, Skype. And if you do use one of these things, like say you use Skype, uninstall the one that's built in, install the proper desktop version. That's how I recommend you guys do it, okay? Don't use the default ones that are installed. They're, they're garbage, okay? Snip and sketch, that's kind of like uh, the uh, snipping tool. That's on uh, Windows 7, so keep that. Sticky notes, keep that. Tips. I don't need tips. Voice recorder, the built-in one, nah. Go grab Audacity. Weather, nah. You know what I really miss? Weather bug on desktop. Um, they, dropped, they dropped support for it and it's 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 very sad. I really wish Weatherbug will come back. Web media extensions, WebMP, Xbox. Don't need that on here. Xbox Game Bar. They won't let you, they'll let they'll let you uninstall Xbox, but you can't uninstall the Game Bar. <laughs> Stupid. Xbox Live. 
your phone. Okay, so we uninstalled everything that they allow us to install on here. Cool. Um, like I said, there's a lot more tweaking we'll do. We also got power options to mess with. Um, I'm also going to go into uh, Windows Update again, see how that's doing. So as you see, it's still downloading. That will take a while. I'll go into uh, Task Manager, see how our system's running here. Go into Performance. See, there's our eight, th eight threads. So this is our Intel Core i7 6700T. It's currently clocked at, um, it's moving around, that's normal. So look at that usulation, guys. Not too bad. Yep, eight megabyte layer three cache, four cores, eight logical processors, one socket. There's our RAM. 32 gig of RAM. Our SSD. Samsung SSD, 970 EVO plus one terabyte. Our Ethernet. There's our Intel NIC. And that's another good thing about these units. They use Intel NICs. And if a unit has Intel V Pro, it has to have an Intel NIC. And it has to have a proper Intel Wi-Fi card. Just, just to note. GPU, Intel HD Graphics 530. Look at that. So everything in here, it shows the driver version too. Driver date is uh, August 24th, 2022, so not too outdated. That's why I went and that's why I went and installed the one directly from Intel. It's gonna be a lot newer. 16 gig of a uh, of VRAM there. I'm guessing it's sharing some of that off the regular RAM. Got app history, startup. In here you can disable some things that don't need to start up on default. But yeah. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Yep. Got one terabyte. Network. And look at that, it sees everything else on the network. <laughs> oh, another thing you'll want to do is we'll, we'll want to change this com the computer name of this system. I'll do that too. Look at all this garbage. It's a joke. Oh, look, Word, unpin, unpin. Is there an uninstall? No, there's not an uninstall. There's an uninstall for that. And see, this is just so stupid about Windows 10, is you'll have three different places where you can uninstall stuff, and it's not consistent. So see how we went into the app and, apps and programs? Spotify was not in there. Yeah, it's in the start menu. And then if you go to the control the old legacy control panel to install stuff, it's not in there either. There's three different spots you have to check. It is so stupid. You got Disney Plus. Watch. Uninstall. This app. Ants related info will be on. It's an app. Why wasn't it in app and, apps and programs? <laughs> Isn't that stupid? Clip Champ. Video editor. No. Prime Video. Uninstall. TikTok, are you serious? Uninstall. Instagram, uninstall. Messenger. Oh, you're not going to let me go all the way down. I see how it is. Uninstall. Calculator. I don't want to install it. I just don't want it in there. Microsoft Store, unpin. Microsoft's to-do, uninstall. Photos, unpin. Edge, unpin. Is this stuff installed? It acts like it's... It doesn't give you an option to uninstall it, so I'm just going to unpin. There we go. Now look at that. <laughs> Crazy, right? It's Windows 10 for you. 
So now we'll go through the start menu list. Alarms and clock. Cochlear camera, Cortana. Get help. Intel, maps. Can't get red maps. Edge, store, OneDrive, people. Can't get red people. Settings, snip and sketch, sticky notes. Accessories. Okay, so it's pretty much slimmed down there. Next place I'm going to check is control panel. Okay, control panel looks good. Awesome. So, still got some time. Next thing I'm going to check is power options. Unplug it and turn off. So, screen will set that for 30 minutes. Never. One thing you want to do never let your computer sleep. You want to be in control of your computer. Okay? And we'll click Advanced Power Settings. So see how it says Turn on Fast Startup Recommended? I'm gonna, you want to uncheck that. You don't want Fast Startup, okay? Show sleep in the power menu? No. Don't want hibernate either. Okay. Want to turn off the display? Okay. So we're editing balanced. I usually put this on high performance, but since it's a small unit, I don't want it running the cores at, you know, full turbo all the time, just generating excess heat. So... We have turn off hard disk after 20 minutes. You're going to set that down to zero for never. Internet Explorer, JavaScript, maximum performance, desktop background settings, available wireless adapters, maximum performance, sleep, never. Allow hybrid sleep, no. Hibernate after, never. Allow awake timers, yes. USB settings, disabled. Intel Graphics, Balanced, PCI Express, Moderate, Processor Power, okay, so minimum processor state is 1, is 5, I'm going to set that to 1, System Cooling, Active, Maximum Processor is 100, Display, 30 minutes, that's fine, Multimedia, There we go. So our power settings have been adjusted. Okay. So as you can see, the Windows updates are still downloading. Just going through optimizing some stuff. I like that they don't put default stuff on here anymore. This PC. That's nice. Oh. I'll run us. We'll take a look at Samsung Magician too while we're at it. Oh, there's our drive. Let's check network connection. Oh, well now it has a computer internet connection, so that should update. There we go. Good. Temperature of the drive's okay. Drive details says it's genuine. Of course it is. Click update. So our firmware on our NVMe drive is the latest. Everything's the latest. That's good. Interface PCI Express Gen 3 by 4. NVMe driver is Samsung. That's what you want to see, guys. That's what you want to see. So I'll also go in and change the computer name.
So see device name, it says desktop, blah, blah, blah. We don't want that. We want to rename this PC. So it will be renamed to GTXL Workbench. Okay. Processors and Intel Core i7-600T, 32 gig of RAM. Oh, another thing. Our license, right? Look at this. Windows 10 Pro. It's legit. And notice, when, I, when we went to install Windows 10, it didn't ask us for what edition we wanted because it picked it up. And notice, there's nothing on this system that says um, you need to enter a product key. Desktop, yes. Confirm. Advanced settings. So I enabled remote desktop because I want that to be enabled on this system. Another thing I want to do is I want to change my work group. We have to restart the computer before we can change the work group. But you definitely want to go in here and change your work group. Now, if you haven't changed your work group before on any of your computers, it's fine because the default work group is a work group. But all my computers operate off the GTEx Cell work group, so I'll have to come in here and change that. You see it does add the new name. Okay. If you want to, you can turn BitLocker on for the drive. Focus sound display. Cool. Virus and threat. Smith. Smith, firewall network, that's fine. Okay. Beautiful. Core isolation, security processor. Okay. I'll, uh, uh, we'll have to look that up. I'll go back in the Windows update, see where we're at. This is normal for it to sometimes get stuck on downloading 100%. You just have to be patient, let it do its thing, and it will do it. We can also change our active hours and stuff like that. Let's see. Receive updates for other Microsoft products when you update Windows, yes. No. Delivery optimization. Okay. This right here, this first one, if you have Microsoft Office installed, you're gonna wanna have that enabled. That will update your, your Microsoft Office. Because those get security updates. Your Word, Excel, PowerPoint, those get security updates. And you want to be receiving those. Okay? So you want to go in there and turn that on. I don't have Word installed on this yet. But I, or I mean Office. 
but I probably will um, buy Office and put on this computer. The one that's built into Windows 10, that's just an advertisement. That's not real Office. Get it off there. If you want Office, buy it legit. And you can buy a perpetual license too. It's called Microsoft Office Home and Student Edition. Anything else I need to do on this system? I mean, waiting for this, I mean, we might as well freaking put Chrome on it. <laughs> yep. You could also change your uh, image and everything on here. I'll do that later. They really want you to uh, use a Microsoft account. You can also change to where your username is just Excel, but your actual name that, that's displayed is will be your actual real name, Victor Koss. There's a way to do that uh, within the user editor. You could change your icon, you could change your photo and everything like that. I'll do that later. And see, this is a local account. That's what you want. Yeah. Yeah, you, you do want to go in and change the PC name because that's what it will be identified on the network as. So you want to do that. Otherwise, you're going to just be seeing random desktop names and stuff, and you're like, what the hell? What's that, you know? So we changed it to Dutexcel dash workbench. And she's running. I guess I could go and uh, put Chrome on here and do a Google search of that missing uh, device. Oh my God, this is ugly. You know what Edge is good for? Downloading another browser. Download. There we go. Downloading Chrome. Is it downloaded? Where to download to? Right here. Maybe. I don't see it. Did it download? It didn't download. There it goes. Just had to kick it in the balls. Open file. Yes. We can go ahead and close out of crappy ass edge. There we go. Now we're installing Chrome. Beautiful. See that guys? And since it is also downloading Windows updates in the background, downloading Chrome will be slow too. But it is what it is. I am unfortunately on 10 meg DSL <laughs> with a lot of people on the internet, a lot of devices on the internet. You'd be amazed. You're like, wow, how... Do you survive? I don't know. Just imagine everybody com everybody competing for that 10 meg worth of bandwidth. You'd be surprised though what uh, what 10 meg can do. <laughs> you can do various video streams because a lot of stuff on the internet is heavily compressed. So usually I'm watching YouTube. Mom's usually watching Netflix. Dad's watching YouTube TV. If Ben's home, he's on YouTube or Instagram or TikTok. Um, all that fighting for bandwidth. And usually you have to run each stream around 720p. Um, 
if not too many people are on, you can definitely run 1080p all day long on uh, YouTube because the 1080p bitrate is like, you know, like what, four or five meg? So Chrome is a downloading. Sounds good to me. And of course, after this, I also check to make sure that the uh, Windows updates are going. Those Windows updates, even when you get them done, you have to restart, check them again, install, restart, check them again, until it says no updates available. That's the process you guys have to do. It's very time consuming. Um, it is faster if you have other machines on the network that already have the updates. So I wonder if I keep this system up to date. If I have another system on the network that has Windows 10, if it can just pull the files directly from this system. That'd be pretty, pretty neat. It says delivery opt optimizations. It should be able to see other devices on that on your same LAN network and communicate over the LAN network rather than going over the internet. Installing, look at that. Look at that, guys. Beautiful. We got a real uh, browser installed. Huh. Wow, did I mention this keyboard is uh, nice to use? Did I mention that? Yes, it's me. Yes, I'm in. Air. Enter passphrase. <laughs> Yeah, we're syncing. You can choose what to sync. Yep. Awesome. So now it's going to pull down all my settings for Chrome, all my plugins. As you guys can probably see, it's gonna start loading a bunch of stuff. <laughs> Look at it go. <laughs> guys, just gotta give it a second here. You don't wanna close out Chrome, you wanna keep it running. Don't wanna deal with this yet. Nice. About Chrome, we're running 64-bit. Chrome's up to date. Let's see, system. Continue running background apps when Chrome is closed now. Use hardware acceleration. We'll keep that on. If you have issues with video playback and stuff, you'll want to turn that off. Some downloads, that's fine. Continue where you left off. Default browser, Chrome, we'll make it default. Search engine, Google, parents, privacy, fill. Okay. Chrome is installed. I think it's pulled everything, most mostly everything anyway. We're going to go ahead and put this through the ringer, see what this is. Unknown device. Looks like an ACPI driver. What is this? Lenovo Active Protection System. 
M900 Tiny. Is that the right thing missing? We'll see here. Yeah, we have the M900 Tiny. Okay. Looks like we got two of them here. Which one do we need? An active protection system driver, read me. Oh. We want this one. Download that. Not sure what that really is. Open file. Yes. Hopefully that'll fix our uh, driver issue there. Install. Yep. Okay. Oh. Before we forgot, we got to run that uh, firmware update utility for the Intel management engine. Forgot about that. We'll, we'll definitely take care of that here in a sec. Hit install. It's installing. So that's the active protection system. We'll go ahead and say no. I'll restart my computer later. Finish. Notice how I'm keeping... Uh, Chrome open for a little while, just so it can sync everything fully and get all the stuff downloaded it needs to download. Okay, so notice if you're not paying attention and checking it routinely, some of this stuff will be stuck on pending install, so we gotta click install now. Okay. You also got a note, just because it says restart now, you don't press that, you wait for everything to Finish installing, okay? Before you even think about doing that. Okay? Wait until everything says pending restart. Now this error up here, well not really an error, just this red notice. Some settings are managed by your organization. That just means we did a group policy edit changing the Windows update settings from the defaults. Because remember, we're not pulling drivers from Windows Update. System's definitely working. Yeah, I can hear her kicking up. So that's the front. You guys want to hear the back? You see, she makes a little bit of noise, huh? She's definitely running uh, toasty. I'll definitely have to address that. I also noticed when I was installing the RAM, when I was looking back at the video feed, the video, um, the bottom DIM module didn't look like it was fully seated on one of the ends. Like you see, you could still see a little bit of the gold contacts. So I'll go and reseat that later. I mean, it's obviously fine because it sees both the RAM and the RAM passed, but uh, just for completion's sake, I will go back in, do that, reseat that, reseat that bottom module. It's still installing. Accumulative update. Um, Patch Tuesday was uh, two days ago, so. We're gonna have December's uh, security updates. So that's a good thing, right? I think Chrome has been open long enough to pull down everything it needs. So I'll go ahead and uh, close it now. Even though this system is probably most likely overheating, it's still being fairly responsive. <laughs> But also, when we restart the computer, remind me, we're going to run the firmware update for the management engine. Remember we installed the utility for it? It should be on this system. So we will do that.
That's important. If you have an Intel V Pro system, you got you're gonna want to make sure you keep that firmware updated for security reasons. This isn't just this computer. Windows updates are slow on any computer. Just don't think this system is slow. <laughs> I guess I can show you guys what the active hard drive Tigulite looks like. Okay, so as we can see, both of these say pending restart. So cumulative update, pending restart, cumulative update, pending restart. So we'll go ahead and click restart now. We'll let it restart. Getting Windows ready. Do not turn off computer. Working on updates. Another time when you definitely want to have a UPS on your computer. Definitely. Project to light is blinking. Oh, there we go. She's now restarting. Let's see how fast she boots. Well, whenever you're doing Windows updates, it takes longer to boot because it's, you know, still initializing the updates. Well, we'll see. The CPU would probably perform better if it wasn't on fire. That's going by pretty damn fast. You can definitely hear the fan revving up in that. It's unfortunate. We'll also verify that the uh, name change, and I'll change the work group, the work group, over to to Excel. Cleaning up. Well, that's a good thing. Should say uninstalling half the fucking bloatware that's included. So even though this says you're up to date, you're going to click check for updates again. And make sure it says that. Because usually nine times out of ten, there'll be more updates available. So just keep doing this over and over until you don't have updates. It's not like Linux, okay? We can now change the work group. And also, if you had a Windows domain in an active directory, this is actually where you'd come and add your domain. Okay. We start later. We'll go back to Windows updates because we probably disturbed it. So, as you guys can see, yes, there definitely were updates. So 
Windows Defender, those are antivirus definition updates for the built-in antivirus. There's no, there's no reason to have an antivirus anymore paying for those. The one that's built into Windows 10 is more than sufficient. Nope. So there's no reason you should go in and routinely check your updates because you also get definition updates. There we go. So see how it said that? We're going to click it again until it shows no updates available. Okay, we're being very persistent. You have to be. Okay, so we're good. So see that? Doesn't show anymore after we did that. Awesome. So now the system is fully up to date. We're going to verify the drivers as well. How you do that is you just open up Start Menu, type in Device Manager, and you make sure that none of these have a, an asterisk. And guess what? None of them do. They are all accounted for now. You can just hit the scan again. Boom, everything's accounted for. All our drivers are intact. P perfect. Okay. We're going to run that uh, management interface um, updater. Drivers. <gasps> Maybe it's this right here, firmware update. Intel firmware update utility. Run as administrator. Oh, there we go. Sing the update image for my verification. Update. Intel firmware update utility. Okay. I think that's how you do it. Looks like it takes a little while to, to run. Does it download? That might be what it does. What do you guys think? Do you think it downloads? Maybe. No, doesn't download. But you see right here, there's a bin file. That's going to be the uh, firmware. Oh, there we go. Oh, restarting. Okay, fine by me. So I think we updated the firmware. Cool. Maybe the, I think the system quieted down. That's another thing. When I was researching these units being getting hot, sometimes people say update the uh, management engine because sometimes it could the version you have could be goofy and it could be chewing up a lot of the CPU, which would in turn make the CPU run hot. Okay, guys, I think that's going to wrap it up for this video. We got Windows installed. I'm not going to go through the process of installing all the programs and stuff. Um, I am going to look in the, into the thermal situation because this unit is running a little bit hot. <laughs> so I will definitely install um, HWMON and take a look at the temps, CPU temps, and um, take the heat sink off and reapply thermal compound. Uh, but all the drivers are accounted for. Windows is fully installed and updated. Everything is everything is running properly. So, uh, guys, anyway, thanks for watching. Take care.